While these gentlemen are taking up the offering, would you turn to Acts chapter 18? Hey guys, I just want to tell you, I love you very much. I thank God for this church. Thank you, Hunter, for praying for me and John and for BJ. That meant a lot to me. Um, Byron has sent out an email to you, and if you'll open it and sort of navigate through, it tells you about the Nigeria trip. It tells you the 30 men that will be um, discipling. It tells you their names. Um, would you please put a star by that in your email box so that it doesn't get shuffled and lost? And then soon, Byron is going to design a uh, prayer calendar so that each day of the week uh, you'll know kind of what we're doing and a scripture or two to pray for us. But I do love you guys, and I'm thankful for this church. Uh, I miss you when you're not here. It's so good to see you this morning. And for any who might be home worshiping online, thank you for not just sleeping in uh, that you made the effort to dial in online but but you know and we know that it's not the same so we hope to see you soon all right acts 18 would you please stand and let's honor god who gave us his word we'll be reading 1 through 11. after these things he left athens and went to corinth and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for they were trade, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself entirely or completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. You may be seated. May God give his blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the living of his holy word. If you're just joining us, or if you've missed a few weeks, Acts 17, Paul preached a brilliant message in Athens, Sermon on Mars Hill, it's known as, and he had a mixed result. That's how it's going to be every time you preach or share the gospel over coffee. Uh, you're going to have a mixed result. Some will say, hey, this is interesting. I'd like to hear more. And maybe they're serious. Maybe they're just giving you the old Tennessee two-step some will say, uh, you're ridiculous, this is ludicrous, and they might get hostile with you. And then some, by the grace of God, will say, hey, I, I'm with you. I'm ready to, to follow Jesus and follow you. So it was a mixed result. And with that mixed result, Paul now takes the 53-mile trip from Athens to Corinth. He wasn't entirely alone because... Some of these brand new converts, it said, followed him. But he was alone in the sense of he didn't have Silas and he didn't have Timothy. Now, they'll catch up with him in verse 5. But he didn't have a kindred spirit. And so he, he's making that 53-mile walk 
somewhat alone and somewhat discouraged. Sure, he was encouraged by some of what I just mentioned, those investigating and those following, but there was some real discouragement that had set in as well. And so when he arrived at Corinth, he's got a mixed emotion. And I'm sure what he experienced in Corinth didn't encourage him greatly because the town of Corinth was so wicked. We know that from reading 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Even the Christians in Corinth struggled with sexual immorality. It was just so embedded in their culture. But it's been said that to be a Corinthian was to be an adulterer. To be a Corinthian was to be a fornicator. To be a Corinthian was synonymous with being a whoremonger. That's just the culture that he walked into. And so as I mentioned, he's a little bit discouraged. And we know that because look at verse, and this is going to be our main text, look at verse 9, 10, uh, verses 9 and 10. It says, And the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Let me just read to you a brief quote from Dr. MacArthur about Paul's attitude at this point. He says, as he arrived in Corinth, Paul felt greater discouragement. The combination of only limited access at Athens, loneliness, and the prospect of facing this new ungodly city accounts for the weakness and fear that gripped the Apostle Paul's heart when he arrived Reflecting on his state of mind when he first arrived in the city, Paul would later write to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 2, 3. He says, I was with you in much weakness, in much fear, in much trembling. We don't think of Paul that way very often. So if you've ever been weak and fearful, trembling, uh, wanting to shut your mouth instead of open your mouth, just be silent and sort of shriek into the, uh, the shrubs there. Paul felt that way as well. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 7, Paul wrote, For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. So we see fear, uh, timidity, uh, trembling, weakness. This, is, this was Paul at this moment in his life. I love what Charles Spurgeon said about the discouragement for the Christian and particularly for ministers of the gospel. He says, Christians are promised tribulation in this world and ministers, you're promised even more. You may expect a larger share of problems than others. Listen, so that you may learn to empathize with the Lord's suffering people, and so be fitting shepherds of a herding flock. So God, of course, knew that Paul felt this way, and he is going to send some help. We're going to see some of these uh, pieces of the puzzle that God's going to send. Let me just, again, I meant to read this one more quote from uh, Dr. MacArthur, he says, where is it? Oh yeah, here we go. God would not leave him alone. The God of all comfort, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, who comforts the oppressed, 2 Corinthians 7, 6, did not leave Paul in this downtrodden condition. He encouraged his struggling servant through four means. And this won't be my outline, but this is MacArthur's and it's helpful. The companionship of friends, the blessing of converts, the fellowship of God, and the frustration of his enemy's plans. These are the very blessings any depressed servant of the Lord can cling to for encouragement. So as I mentioned, God knew that Paul was like this and he's going to send help. Uh, if you'll scroll down to verse 5, Silas and Timothy arrive. Those were his his right-hand and left-hand men at this point. 
But even before we, we get to that point in the story, we are introduced to two other people. And today, I'm not going to spend much time talking about Aquila and Priscilla. That'll be next week's message. But look at verse 2, and again, just think about God sending help to his struggling servant. And he found a Jew. That's just interesting, isn't it? He found. We know that he didn't just find him. God was directing traffic. But from his perspective, from Luke's perspective in the story, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So what, what God's people's enemies mean for evil, God turns into good. This ruler is commanding all the Jews to flee, and we believe at this point in the story, Aquila and Priscilla were already believers in Jesus as Messiah. They go to Corinth, and it just so happens that that's where Paul arrives. And it just so happens that they're tent makers like he was the tent maker. And so they began to lodge together and work together. You know, no coincidences here. It was Jesus who had said, you should go out two by two. No Lone Ranger Christians. So God sovereignly, God graciously connected Paul with this power couple, literally. They're a very powerful couple that God uses in Paul's life and in the church of Ephesus and in many other ways. At this point, I mentioned Paul is making tents to take care of his own needs, and so he's got a sort of divided heart. It's another reason I want to tell you that I love you and I appreciate you. Um, we'll see in a moment, but when Silas and Timothy arrived... They had a love offering with them from the church in Thessalonia. Um, just jot it down if you care to, but 2 Corinthians 11, 9 and Philippians 4, 15 speak of this love offering that Timothy and Silas bring. And when he gets the love offering, he says, I don't have to make tents anymore. <laughs> and then he begins to fully devote himself to preaching Jesus. And I think about just recently when we were able to, when Todd and Ariana and I were able to go to Louisville and to take nearly $2,000 of your money and put it into Travis and Macy Ayers' hands and say, we love you. God loves you. Carry on. And I just saw the relief that that uh, gift caused them because they're, they're stressed. They're trying to make ends meet. Travis says, I need to work more so I can have more money to supply for my family, but I can't work more because I'm at that threshold of my grades are already starting to slip a little bit because I just don't have time to study. So that was a tremendous blessing that you were able to give them. I think of the fact that I'm able to work full time here at Providence and devote myself entirely to preaching Jesus and making disciples and shepherding souls. So I just want to say thank you. It, it was a blessing to Paul. It was a blessing to Travis and Macy. It's a blessing to me. And it is through your tithe and offering that that happened and happens. So let me just read a, a, a verse to show you how, how much Aquila and Priscilla meant to, to Paul. And I said next week we're going to really dive into them. But listen to Romans 16 verses 3 and 4. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So Aquila and Priscilla, they were, they were that kindred spirit. Remember I said earlier that Paul was walking 53 miles from Athens to Corinth, and he wasn't alone because he had some brand new converts with him. But he kind of was alone because he didn't have Timothy and Silas. But then he meets Aquila and Priscilla. And they are just a, a, fresh, a fresh drink of water, a cool breeze. They are kindred spirit. They would lay down their lives, so to speak, lay down their, put it on the line, their necks on the line for Paul. So I just want to stop for a moment and say, it is good, it is wise 
for you to pray for yourself and for your spouse, your children, your church, that God would put some kindred spirit brothers and sisters in your life. I know when Sydney was getting ready to go off to Anderson, we, we beat that drum constantly, and we still do. When Eli was going off to Athens, we beat that drum constantly and still do. We pray that for Anna Grace. We pray that for Caleb. I pray that for my wife. I pray that for myself. I pray that for you, that you would understand that you're not meant to be a Lone Ranger and that you would look for others who are walking with Jesus closely, that they are a fresh breeze to your soul, a, a, a drink of cold water to your, to your very life. And watch this. Why don't you pray that you would be that answer to someone else's prayer who's praying that same thing? Because it's a two-way street. You need a good godly friend or two, but so does the person to your right and to your left and in front of you and behind you. So pray for that and then pray, God, make me that, that person in someone else's life. As I said, verse 5, when Timothy and Silas arrived, they had a love offering uh, from the church in Thessalon Thessalonia. It was a blessing to Paul, and he says, now I can devote myself completely to the word of God. And notice another word he uses in verse 5. He says, devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Does that describe you when you talk to people about the Lord? Now, don't get the wrong idea. Not, not solemnly as in like you have no joy or that, you know, when you decided to follow Jesus, that was the worst decision you ever made. Not that kind of so solemnity. Is that the word? But solemn in a sense of earnest, serious, it, it literally means as one who is under oath and will give an account for his words. Remember last week I said Athens would have been a cool place to vacate, but Paul was not there to sightsee. He was a soul winner. He was not there just to take a vacation. He was on mission. Uh, he was not there just to observe. He was an ambassador. Listen to what he says in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, and this is the same word, solemn. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, be ready out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience. And instruction. And then he says, verse 6. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he took out, he shook out, excuse me, shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And I think it's kind of funny. He goes next door. Here's the synagogue, right? And he goes next door to a man's house that kind of becomes their headquarters. So Paul had this, this tension in his heart, right? I, he says, I don't want to throw what is valuable before swine. I don't want to cast the pearl before swine. You don't want it? Okay, I'm moving on. But he had an, an inner tug in his heart. I can't just turn my back completely. And as he goes and he begins to preach, uh, one of the leaders of the synagogue got saved. Right? So, so things are starting to happen, and it infuriated those in the synagogue, and they're going to come after him. And that's part of the reason for verse 10 and 11 of his discouragement. But notice this phrase, your blood is on your own head. Does that sound familiar to you? That's not the first time this phrase is used. It won't be the last time this phrase is used. Ezekiel, chapter 33, listen to the word of God. 
And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming to the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the trumpet and does not take warning and a sword does come and takes him away, his blood be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken the warning, he would have delivered his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you to be a watchman for the house of Israel so that you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn that wicked man from his ways. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from your hand. But if on your part you warn the wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn, he will die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your life. Paul would say in Acts chapter 20 verse 26, I testify to you that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Now, think about those that God has placed around you. Okay? You got a job in the marketplace, so to speak? Think about your coworkers. You got family, immediate family, and those that you get together with two or three times a year? Think about where you live, your neighbors to the right, to the left. Think about as you shop, you go to Kroger, you go to Publix, you know, you go out to eat, you go to the movies, you go to a ball game, you go to the gym, your kids play soccer, your kids play basketball, you're, you're interacting with a lot of people. Could you say, like Paul said, I am innocent? of the blood of all men. You say, wow, that's pretty strong. Well, I'm just getting started. Because you're also accountable for the nations. And so am I. Did Jesus not say, go and make disciples of all the nations? So we have some repenting to do. I have some repenting to do. We are to warn those without Christ that judgment is coming. And notice how Ezekiel put it. If, if they don't hear, they're still going to die in their iniquity. If they do hear but reject, they're going to die in their iniquity. But on this one, you are free of their blood, and on this one, their blood is on your hands. Now, if that sounds incredibly man-centered to you, it's not. It's in the Bible. And, and here's the funny thing. In just a minute, we're going to go completely God-centered. Verse 10, where he says, I have many people in this city. He wasn't talking about the population of Corinth. He was talking about, I have many elect in this city that I have chosen before the foundation of the world, but they got to hear the gospel, Paul. So you hang in there and preach. And they did hear the gospel and they did repent and believe. But this is not a, a contradiction in scripture. These are, are right beside one another in scripture. So as I mentioned, Paul's going to leave, sort of. He goes next door. He begins preaching. He's persuading I love that word persuading because it means some dialogues going on. It's not just, you know, pulling the, the pen on the gospel grenade, throwing it into someone's life, and then running for the hills. There's some give and take. There's listening to their questions. 
There's reasoning with them from the scriptures, from the gospel. So, one final point before we get to our, our last and main point. Notice in verse 8, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with his whole household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. Just want to say this, and, and please know, every time I say this, I'm not like a used car salesman. I don't get, uh, you know, some kind of um, bonus if, if we baptize X amount of people in, in a month. I'm going at it right from the Word of God. But the, if you notice in the book of Acts, and it's really all through the New Testament, but we're in the book of Acts, believe, baptized. Believe, baptized. Believe, baptized. So I, I, not only is that a good you know, prescription for believer's baptism as opposed to infant baptism, but it's a good reminder that believers are to be baptized. That is kind of your coming out party where you say to a group who's going to hug you to death, right? So some, I'm intimidated, I can't. Yeah, we might harm you. We might hug you to death, right? But it's, it's your way of saying in front of people who love Jesus and who love you, you're saying, I'm not ashamed of Christ. I'm his follower. I'm coming out publicly and as I go down into the water and come up out of the water, I am reminding myself and all of you that I have put my hope in one who went down into the grave and came up victorious. I'm putting my hope in Christ. And he washed away my sins, not this water. So I just want to put that plug in. If you are a believer and you have not been baptized, why not? Let's do this for the glory of God and for the good of your own conscience and for the encouragement of those who will be cheering you on. Let's do this. Now look again at verses uh, 9, 10, and 11. Did you notice there's three commands here and there's three promises? Three commands, three promises. Do not be afraid any longer. There's one. But go on speaking, number two, do not be silent, just to emphasize it. Three, three commands. And then notice verse 10, there's three promises. For I am with you, there's number one, no man will attack you in order to harm you, number two, and number three, for I have many people in this city. So, Let's talk a little bit about this doctrine of election. You know, every time it's mentioned in the Bible, it's mentioned to encourage the saints. Like, you didn't choose me, I chose you, so I'm not going to lose you because I chose you. Right? It's meant to encourage perseverance and hope. It's meant to glorify God. I could say it like this. The doctrine of election humbles the pride of man to the dust and exalts the glory of God to the heavens. And it's not contradictory to what we just read earlier of, if you don't warn them, their blood I will require from your hand. It's not a contradiction. But before we just dive headlong into that, uh, go to Matthew 28. I mentioned this earlier of how it's not just those with whom we work, play, and live that we're responsible to share the gospel, to pray for, uh, but it's, it's the nations. Uh, we need a movement of God, folks, because <laughs> if, if you're like me, it's hard enough to get motivated to go across the street, let alone across the sea. I need God to help me, and, and you do too, right? Right? But look, look at these, again, this, this idea of there's some commands, there's some promises. And I love that. God doesn't just give us commandments and say, go pull yourself up by the bootstraps and make it happen. I'm going to sit over here and drink some lemonade under the shade tree and see if you're strong enough to pull it off. No, 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 no. God is right there in the trenches with us, empowering, enabling our obedience. We saw that in 
Acts 18.10, but now look at this great commission that you know well, but we sometimes know it so well that we don't know it at all. And Jesus, verse 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Did you notice the bookends? There's a promise in verse 18. There's a promise in verse 20. <laughs> if, if, if verse 19 feels overwhelming to you, and it does, it should, well, that's because you're not thinking about verse 18 and verse 20. The one who has all authority is with you, verse 20, even to the end of the age. And then there's the commandments sandwiched in between. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. But I just thought that was a good correlation to what he's telling Paul in Acts 18.10. Um, reminds me of Jeremiah 41.10, my wife's favorite verse. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So yeah, there's some commandments to obey here. Don't shut your mouth, Paul. Open your mouth and speak and stop being afraid. Right? And he does do that. It says he stayed there for one and a half years. That's, he stayed there longer than anywhere else except Ephesus. So, so many times this idea, and I'm, I'm where are you get an election, I'm getting it from verse 10 where he says, for I have many people in this city, right? But so many times this idea of election, it, it's sort of a bucket of cold water on the fire of evangelism or prayer or seeking God, persevering in the trenches, you know. Well, if God's going to do it, God's going to do it. And if I'm elect, then I'm elect. And if I'm not, I'm not. There's not much we can do there. So we'll just eat, drink, and be merry. But that is so against what the t clear teaching of Scripture is. Listen to one verse particularly that caught my attention as I was preparing. 2 Timothy 2.10 Paul says, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of the elect so that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. I, I love that. Paul did not say, well, God, you've got many people in this city, and if they're yours, then you're going to bring them in. Nothing can stop that. So I'm going to get on the ship and, and float down the ocean current a little bit more to an easier place. He says, no, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. Let that sink in. That, that has to become a biblical category in your brain. You might not understand it. Join the club. But it's there. The sovereignty of God in salvation did not lead Paul to roll up his tent pick up his robe and, and run out of the city. It made him dig his heels in and stay another year and a half. As I mentioned, the doctrine of election, it humbles the pride of man to the dust. It exalts the glory of God to the heavens. Just read Ephesians 1. Three times in that one chapter, speaking of election and predestination, Paul says, to the praise of the glory of your grace, God. To the praise of the glory of your grace, God. To the praise of the glory of your grace, God. Verse 6, verse 12, verse 14. But this isn't the first time in the book of Acts that we've seen this doctrine. And turn back four chapters to chapter 13, verse 48. And I'm just going to give you several verses quickly. Buckle your seatbelt. If you need these, uh, I'll give you the list afterwards if you can't write fast enough. 1348, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. 
as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. No, it doesn't say the opposite. And everyone who believed was appointed to eternal life. It doesn't say that. John chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus speaking of the Gentiles, proper but elect, specifically, he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice. They will become one flock with one shepherd. Same gospel, different chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Same gospel, different chapter, John 6, 37, my favorite verse. I've given you my wife's, I'm giving you mine. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast away. Similarly, John 17, 9, I ask, Jesus, this is his high priestly prayer, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but I ask on behalf of all those you have given me. For they are yours, Father. Same author, different book, Revelation. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Just showing again that Jesus, he shed his blood for not just a generic if they receive it, they receive it. If they don't, they don't. But he shed his blood for men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is the idea we get out of Revelation 13, verse 8, where it talks about everyone whose name was written in the book of life from before the foundation of the, of the world. And I've given this illustration before, but I haven't gone to too many of these kinds of restaurants. Normally it's, it's, it's crystal, it's McDonald's, it's uh, Moe's, Moe's is high cotton, you know, but sometimes on, on rare occasions, I've been to a restaurant where we had to call ahead and make reservations. And when you walk in, they stop you at the door and they say, <clears throat> name, please. And you give them your name and they say, oh, yeah, we've been expecting you. And, they, you know, you go over and they point it out. That's similar. You know, this idea in a man-centered way is God's got the pen. And when you repent and believe, he writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and says, congratulations. You, you made your reservations. You called ahead. It's really not that way, is it? The book was written before the foundation of the world. And when we repent and believe, God says, I've been expecting you. You were written in the book before the foundation of the world. You're confirming your reservations. And we've already seen that even our repentance and our belief are gifts of God. We didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to stop being an unbeliever. I'm going to stop being a Christ hater. I'm going to start loving and following Jesus. That is the grace and the, the effectual call of God in our lives. So let me encourage you. Remember I said the doctrine of election is meant to encourage you. It's meant to encourage prayer. It's meant to encourage evangelism. It's meant to encourage perseverance and hope. If you're a Christian this morning, you are a Christian not because you are smarter than other people. Not because you made the right choice, because that's built into your DNA. You were brought up well. You're a Christian because God the Father chose you before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ purchased you on the cross and the Holy Spirit pursued you, opened your heart like, like Byron preached several weeks ago, Lydia. God opened her heart to receive what Paul was speaking the Holy Spirit sealed you for the day of redemption and will indwell you for eternity. The doctrine of election is meant to encourage you, but it's also, as I said, it's meant to encourage evangelism, 
prayer, perseverance. Go back to our text, Acts 18, 10, and 11. Just after God said, For I have many people in this city, and he settled there a year and six months. I mean, Paul was ready to leave. He was quiet, if you can imagine Paul being quiet. He was discouraged. He was afraid. But after this moment with the Lord, he was rock solid. He just needed to be reminded. And by the way, this idea of, and no one will attack you in order to harm you, that was a limited promise at this particular point. I mean, Paul would have his head cut off by Nero a few years from now. And you may say, well, I can't take a claim that promise. That's just a specific promise to Paul in Corinth. True. But I think the application for us could be this. No one can touch you unless God gives them permission. That, that's something you can take to the bank. The elect will repent of their sins. They will trust Jesus Christ. They will treasure Jesus Christ, but not apart from prayer and gospel proclamation. And that's where you come in. And that's where I come in. And that's where those people came in who had prayed for you before you repented and believed. Who shared the gospel with you before you repented and believed. God does the impossible through you and me. You can't raise the dead and I can't either, but God can. You can't open someone's heart, but God can. You can't open someone's mind, but God can. You can't change someone's spiritual taste buds so that they move from thinking Christ is boring or bitter to seeing that He is beautiful. But God can. But He does it through your prayers... He does it through your gospel proclamation, whether it's a pulpit like this right here or it's a cup or a pot of coffee where you're reasoning with this person, Q&A, searching the scriptures, patiently instructing them. But God works the miracle. God does the impossible, but he does it through you and me. So, I don't know where you are in your understanding of election, of, of predestination, of the sovereignty of God. I don't know if this is the first sermon you've ever heard. If you're online watching, if you're here, this isn't the first sermon you've ever heard about this. But I don't know where you are, but I just want to throw out a couple of straw men arguments and carnal reasoning that we sometimes go to. And I just want to ask you in the name of searching truth in the Scripture to denounce these carnal arguments, these, this carnal reasoning. Again, one would be like this. Well, as far as prayer and evangelism and missions, if God's going to save somebody, if God's already chosen them before the foundation of the world and they will be saved, no ifs, ands, or buts, then I'm just going to sit back, cool my heels, Drink some lemonade in the shade. Eat, drink, and be merry. God's going to do it. Well, yes, God's going to do it. You're not indispensable, and nor am I. But that doesn't mean that you should be disobedient to the clear commands of Scripture. God will do it without you, and you'll miss a tremendous blessing. But God says be a part of it. Pray. Pray. Pray with all your might. Persevere. Don't just be timid and, and run the first sign of trouble. Dig your heels in. Remember the three promises, right? For I am with you. He said, um, I have many people in this city and no one can touch you unless I allow them to touch you. So denounce those 
those think those thoughts rather those arguments what about this one now, this isn't just talking about out there you know outside of these four walls missions evangelism prayer for the unreached but what about you right you may be here today and the doctrine of God's sovereignty, the doctrine of God's providence, the doctrine of God's election and predestination has wrongly made you feel like I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry because if I'm elect, I'm elect. If I'm not, I'm not. Listen, God brought you here today to hear the gospel and be prayed for. That's not a small thing. That's hopeful. That's encouraging. God does ordain the end, but he ordains the means to the end. And you're here today, and you're hearing the gospel today, and you're being prayed for right this second. Don't dismiss that. And that should encourage you. And don't overthink it. You know, I heard someone once say, well, I'm not going to repent and believe until I know I'm elect. To which I said, no, by your repenting and believing, you prove that you are the elect. So this should encourage you. This should give you hope. But on the other hand, you have been warned. And to use Paul's very language that he borrowed from Ezekiel. My hands are clean and innocent from your blood. If you, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, will not turn from your sin, trust in Christ, treasure him as supremely beautiful. Put your hope in the one who bled and died for sinners who was buried and raised from the dead, if you will not put your hope in the one who bled, then your blood will be on your own hands because you have been warned. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that before the foundation of the world, before we were even created so that it couldn't be those who were better looking or smarter or richer or taller or shorter or something we could boast in. You chose us before the foundation of the world so that all of the credit, all of the glory goes to you. This beautiful doctrine it humbles our pride. It exalts your glory. Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and bleeding and dying for all of your sheep. Purchasing us, delivering us from the wrath of God by taking the wrath of God for us. Holy Spirit, thank you that on April the 12th, 1990, you pursued me. You opened my heart. You opened my eyes. And for the first time, I saw that I was a great sinner, but that Jesus was the greater Savior. And you're still pursuing sinners today. And would you even do that in this sanctuary and certainly as we leave this sanctuary, would you do that through the very gospel we proclaim? As we always pray, would you save the lost, sanctify the saved, and glorify your name? We ask all of this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.